scare you No evil thing will To see her is to take a sudden chill Cruella, Cruella The curl of her lips The ice in her stare The 101th Dalmatian Chapter the Last Christmas Day at the house in Regent's Park was absolutely wonderful. The rather good hotels sent plenty more steaks, and though there were not, of course, enough presents to go around, the pups were able to play with lots of things in the house, which were not intended to be played with, but were played with ever afterwards. The Dearlies took all the pups into the snowy park. Pongo, Mrs. Simper, around to make sure none got lost. And at twilight, Pongo and Mrs. firmly led the dearlies up to the top of Primrose Hill and barked over a dogdom-wide network. They even managed to get a message through to the gallant Spaniel and for two dogs from a village five miles from him made a special trip in order to bark to him. He sent back a message that he and his dear old pet were very well. Of course, the dogdom-wide barking was relayed. The farthest away dog Pongo and Mrs. spoke to directly was the Brigadier General Great Dane over towards Hampstead who was in great barking form. There is something very mysterious about this barking at twilight, said Mrs. Dearly. Do you think that they are sending messages? Mr. Dearly said it was a charming idea, and then he stopped. Was anything beyond dogs? Not when he thought of all Pongo and Mrs. had done. How had they gotten 97 pups back from Suffolk? Pongo and Mrs. longed to tell them, but they never could. As soon as Christmas was over, Mr. Dearly decided to act quickly, for he realized that 100 Dalmatians were too much for the house in Regent's Park. They were even a bit much for all of Regent's Park. First he advertised in case any of the rightful owners of pups wanted to claim them, but none did for this reason. Corella had bought all the pups except for those stolen from the Dearlies, because it costs a lot to get any expert stealing done these days. Corella had paid more than to the dog thieves who had stole from the dearlies than for any of the litters she had bought. And naturally, people who had sold puppies never thought of them as lost or did anything more about them. Only one owner turned up, the farmer who had owned Perdita, and he was quite happy to sell her to the dearlies. So there, he, there was Mr. Dearly, lucky man with 100 delightful Dalmatians. He decided he must take a large country house. Happily, he could afford this, as the government had once again gotten itself into debt and he had gotten it out. And this time he had been rewarded by an income tax to save his in income tax on. So he had retired from business, except for being always ready to help the government with its sums. One fine day in January, when the snow was all gone, he said to Mrs. Dearly, let us drive out to Suffolk and return the little blue cart to Master Tommy Tompkins, and also hunt for a country house, and we'll have a look at the house where the puppies were imprisoned. Not that we'll take that one. Mrs. Dearly laughed at such an idea. They took Pongo and Mrs. with them, and Lucky came as a stowaway, under a seat, because he wanted to see the sheepdog again and be made a captain. He didn't stay under the seat long, and everyone was delighted to see him when he came out. When they reached the dimpling, they went for a walk around the village and met Tommy Tompkins out with the sheepdog. So the little, little blue cart was returned and, then and there, rather a relief to the dearlies who wouldn't have quite known what to say to Tommy's parents. They, did have enough to, they didn't have anything to say to Tommy, or have to say anything to Tommy, as he was still uh, wasn't quite talking, though his chuckling noises were at last beginning to sound more like human than dog. The dearly saw at once that Pongo, Mrs. and Lucky knew the sheepdog, and the tabby cat came hurrying over. And now we'll find Corella's house, said Mr. Dearly. When they got to Hell Hall, there was a large noticeable there was a large notice outside saying, For sale, cheap, owner gone to warm climate, and the gates stood wide open. The house was empty. The Badden brothers were now in jail for assaulting the man who came to take the television away, which had never been paid for. They weren't minding jail much because meeting so many criminals was almost better than television, and na they now had high hopes of one day appearing on What's My Crime. What a hideous house, said Mrs. Dearly. What a lovely wall, said Mr. Dearly. One thing he had been worrying him, if he took a hundred Dalmatians into the country, how was he to prevent them from running wild? 
This magnificent wall was just the thing. If only the house were not so hideous. Well, suppose it were painted white, he said, and the block of windows were put back. There's a lovely pond in front, almost a lake. Mrs. Dearly shook her head, but when they got into the house and saw the fine large rooms and imagined all of them white instead of red, she began to feel different. Pongo, Mrs. and Lucky raced to the kitchen and the larder, remembering all that happened there. The Dearlies followed them and saw the furnace in the for the central heating. Then they all went out to the stables. These would make fine kennels if they were heated, said Mr. Dearly. Then he looked up and saw the folly. Both he and Mrs. Dearly took a fancy to it, and they decided then and there to buy Hell Hall and make it into a beautiful house. Here we will found a dynasty of Dalmatians, said Mr. Dearly. Mrs. Dearly was insulted. She thought the word meant nasty dying, but Pongo explained that it meant a family that goes on and on. Mr. Dearly added, and we'd better start a dynasty of Dearlies to look after the dynasty of Dalmatians, and Mrs. Dearly quite agreed. The alterations to Hell Hall were quickly made, and one sunny day in the early spring a removal van and an extra-large double-decker motor coach stood outside the house in Regent's Park. The van was for the furniture. The coach was for the Dearlies and the Dalmatians. The nannies had already gone down by car to open Hell Hall. Nanny Butler driving. She added, had added a smart chauffeur's cap to her butler's outfit. Mr. Dearly had come out of the house with Pongo and Mrs. Mrs. Dearly followed with Perdita and with the white cat on her shoulders. The white cat was to start a dynasty at Hell Hall. The Dearlies had promised her a white Persian husband. Within the next few minutes, two surprising things happened. First, just as Mrs. saw the removal van, she said, Oh, there's a miracle. A Staffordshire Terrier flung itself from the van and said, Here we are again, to Pongo and Mrs., and he hurled herself at Mr. Dearly's chest. That's a compliment, if you only knew it, said Jim, who was standing by the van. That's right, said Bill. Old battering ram's fallen for you. And I for him, said Mr. Dearly politely, rising from a sitting position. Pongo and Miss, Mrs. managed to quieten the Staffordshire before he paid any compliments to Mrs. Dearly. <coughs> and then the second surprising thing happened. A large car had drawn up, and the people in it were looking at Pongo, Mrs., and Perdita with interest. Suddenly, there was a wild commotion in the car, and the door burst open, and out sprang a superb liver-spotted Dalmatian. He dashed up to Perdita. It was her long-lost husband. His name was Prince. The people in the big car were so were much touched by his faithfulness to Perdita and at once offered him to the Dearlies, saying that they would be glad for a good home for him, as they were always going abroad and having to leave him in kennels. Prince was delighted. Apart from wanting to be with Perdita, he knew good pets when he saw them. So the Dalmatians started for Suffolk, 101 strong. They all sat up in the motor coach seats, looking out of the windows, with many people who saw them pass cheered for there had been so much about them in the papers that they were now quite famous, and many, many dogs lined the route as word of the journey had gone out by the twilight barking. The waiting dogs barked their good wishes, and the Dalmatians barked their thanks. So it was a rather noisy in the motor coach. The Dearlies didn't mind. They thought happy barking was a pleasant noise. Prince was rather shy at first, so Mr. Dearly sat beside him and punched him in the way that some big dogs like to be punched. The punching needs to be hard enough, but not too hard. It must please, not hurt. And Mr. Dearly was a highly skilled dog puncher. Prince thumped his tail and suddenly gave Mr. Dearly's ear a playful nip, which was much appreciated. After that, Perdita's handsome husband felt he was completely one of the family. When the Dalmatians reached the village of Dimpling, all the villagers were out to receive them, with the sheepdog, the tabby cat, and Tommy Tompkins well to the fore. The cows were lowing, a loving welcome from the farm. Tommy had his little blue cart with him, and the cad pig felt just quite a bit envious, but she was happy to know that she had grown too strong to need any cart. The white Persian cat, who was now a charming creature, kindness makes kind cats, was extremely gracious to the farmyard tabby. It was the beginning of a firm friendship. At last, the motor coach drove through the wide open gates of Hell Hall, the pond now reflected the snow-white house with muslin curtains and all the windows. 
the front of the house seemed like a face and had an expression, but now it was a pleasant expression. The nannies were at the open front door. As they came to meet the dearlies, Nanny Butler said, Do you know that there's a television aerial on the roof of this house? And Nanny Cook said, Seems wasteful not to make use of it. Then Mr. Dearly knew that the nannies wished for television in the kitchen, and he at once suggested it. Pongo and Mrs. were delighted, for they knew how, much, how, how very much their smallest daughter had missed it. But during the many happy hours that the Cadbig was to sit watching, in the, watching it in the warm kitchen, she never quite liked it quite as much as that other television, that still, silent television she had seen on Christmas Eve when the puppies had rested so peacefully in the strange, lofty building. She often remembered that building and wondered who owned it. Someone very kind, she was sure, for in front of every one of the many seats there had been a little carpet-eared, puppy-sized dog bed. And that's the end of the 101 Dalmatians. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know, there's a sequel to this book called The Starlight Barking. You should know what a sequel is, especially if you have seen movies like Star Wars that have these different, you know, chapters and stuff, or episodes. So um, that was the end of the 101 Dalmatians. Um, let me know if you want to hear the sequel. If you do, maybe I'll do that one next. Happy days. See you.